so as uh, Michael already said, Ben couldn't come to chat, but on his behalf and behalf of other members of Lofa uh, Pulsar Working Group, I will give an overview of um, uh, Lofa Telescope and present some of our latest results. So uh, I will start off with a brief introduction to Lofa and highlight its capabilities. And for the rest of my talk, I will feature some of our latest results because later in the week there will be many other talks uh, uh, related to Lofa. So many results, many more results will be presented. And I uh, will finish off with what improvements are coming over the next few months. Uh, as many of you already know, uh, LOFAR is an interferometric array of dipole antenna stations distributed in the Netherlands and a few European countries. It operates at the very low radio frequencies from 10 to 240 megahertz, and it consists of the 24 core stations here, and the, the central part of this core 4 by 6 station is called SuperTOP. SuperTOP provides an uh, LGBT-like collecting area with the beam size of about half a degree at the frequency 140 megahertz. For the full core with a, uh, with a size of about two kilometers across, it's already a receiver-like collective area and the beam size of about five arc minutes at the same frequency. There are also international stations. There are currently eight of them, and they're as big, as twice as big as the Dutch stations, but they also can operate uh, independently from the rest of the array. Uh, I, I wanted to also to point out that these international stations are very powerful telescopes on their own right, and their collective area is comparable to that of the Park Radio Telescope. So th this slide uh, shows the pictures of individual dipoles for LBA and HBA antennas. Uh, HBA tiles, shown here, uh, consist of 16 uh, HB tiles shown here consist of 16 board tied dipoles, and there are 48 tiles for Dutch stations and 96 for international stations. LOFAR operates at the very uh, low frequencies visible from the Earth, and at 10 megahertz there is a cut off due to atmospheric reflection. Operating at such a low frequency, LOFAR covers the lowest four octaves of the radio window. And this makes this telescope very unique as the only one operating at such low frequencies with the huge instantaneous fractional bandwidth. Uh, it's, it's literally not possible to cover all interesting results and topics in 20 minutes talk. So I just want to make sure that there will be a number of dedicated talks later this week where more results will be featured. And in my talk here, I will focus on some other highlights. So moving on to lower capabilities, we can form uh, multiple station beams uh, because LOFAR is very flexible and electronically steep aperture array. So this slide shows the multiple station beams pointing at, at different, uh, simultaneously pointing in different pulses. The separation between outermost beams in this world is about 65 degrees. This technology will be very crucial uh, for the SKA. In standard, we can form up to eight uh, widely separated field of views but then optionally we can form up to 244. Within each of the station beams, we can also form multiple tight array beams by applying proper phase delays between station one and then coherently. At the moment, we can form tight array beams only for the 12th substation at the super door here. And this is possible, uh, only possible because on this 12th substation are running on the single clock. Uh, the plot here shows the tide array beams, 19 tide array beams uh, in hexagonal pattern around the pulsar with pulsar being offset uh, from the center. And pulsar showed up nicely at the tide array beam where it was expected. Forming 127 tide array beams, we can cover the entire station beam, which is shown by a white circle here. And the signal to noise ratio of other tide array beams is in order of magnitude smaller than in the tidal rate beam where the pulsar is. Uh -huh. The field of view of the station beam is very large. It's large enough to cover the entire Andromeda galaxy, for example. And we can map this Andromeda galaxy with narrow tidal ray beams in one single observation. Or we can also form a few station beams to cover a larger field of view, as shown for the Virgo cluster as an example. And then we can, we can customize individual narrow tidal array beams pointing in different galaxies. 
So this slide summarizes uh, all B4 modes that are well tested and currently available for wider community. Do not try to digest it, there are many possible. Uh, but the main point is that the system is very flexible to match the different size goals. I want just to point out that we can record different data products, total intensity, full stocks, or complex voltage data. And we are recording all the data into HD5 data format, and we are currently working to be able to read it directly with DSPSR and Preston. In addition to the beamform observation, we can also do simultaneous imaging observation. And in the, in, in the slide here, there is an image of the sky region with the pulse BO329 plus 54 on the left, and on the right, there is a pulse stack from the same pulse with the average profile on the top. Uh, a few words about RFI environment. It is very clean, as you can see from this typical example from the RFI find utility. Uh, it's much better than people thought. And there are several reasons for this. First is that we're using 12-bit ADCs at the station level, so dynamic range is very high. And also dipoles, they are located very uh, low to the ground, so they are not picking a lot of terrestrial RFI. And this is because the sensitivity of dipoles is very low towards the horizon. Uh, typically, we flag about 1-2% of the data in HBA and 3-4% in LBA. But below 30 MHz, it gets very contaminated. We are currently working on expanding the number of stations working on the single clock from six super turf stations uh, to the entire core of 24 core stations within one, roughly one kilometer radius shown by the dashed circle here. This is due by the end of September. And I want to make sure you, everyone uh, actually brings this message to home that this will quadruple our raw sensitivity of the system. So the system sensitivity will be increased by four times by the end of September. We are currently doing tests uh, test of the new single clock boards between super clock station CS002 and uh, core station CS401, which is already running on the single clock. So the observation here uh, of the pulse BO329 plus 54 at transit shows the expected fan beam pattern with the, uh, with the maximum, uh, with the, uh, maximum very close to the intended phase center, which already do, looks very good, but of course some tweaking and integration is still required. So all modes, capabilities, and many more commensal results we already described in our first law for paper by Stuckers at all. And now, now I will present some of our latest work. I want just to make sure that here are, these highlights are not the old highlights from the uh, current Lofer work, because other highlights will be also featured in other Lofer talks this week. So first of all, we already published uh, our second Lofer paper led by Tom Hassel, who studied dispersion measure and profile variations of four pulses using simultaneous wide band observations uh, uh, you, uh, between uh, different telescopes, including lower LBA and HBA data. We find that dispersion law is, is better than one part in 10 to 5, and we also put a constant on emission height from aberration and retardation arguments for, for those pulses. And the results for the pulse B1133 plus 16 is shown here. We are also working on LAFOR pulse profiles paper, which will include profiles for more than 100 pulses and align them with high-frequency data from the Jodl uh, Bank and Westerbork Observatories. Uh, this plot shows uh, the profiles for pulses B0402 plus 61 and B1133 plus 16. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the time alignment for this data was done using the timing solution in spans about 10 years and using the best dispersion measure from the current epoch. Of course, only after that, it's only uh, moderate shifting was required by one or two uh, beams. These observations uh, was about one hour uh, long for LBA uh, uh, data and about 15 minutes for HBA data. Uh, LOFAR is very capable of, and we already started doing observations of millisecond pulses. So the plots here show very high quality profiles by blue line here in uh, different parts of the HBA band. And as a comparison, the profile in the, in the bottom, the black one, is the previously known profile from the study using the data from the Bush and the sub observatory phase rate at 102 megahertz. And we already started 
during uh, commensal time and observation of millisecond pulses. The plot here shows the pre-fit residuals for one of the millisecond pulses, and the slight residuals here is probably due to the uh, different uh, deviations in the dispersion measure. This, uh, we will start a real campaign for timing MSP when we will have a single clock. So basically, effectively, from the October this year, we will start the real timing campaign. As I already said, oh, low for uh, can operate down to very low radio frequencies, down to 10 megahertz. And even at such low frequency, the sensitivity is high enough to see remarkable profile evolution of the pulse at the weight of 74. Uh, currently in OBA, we can detect up to 12, 13 pulses, but this number will increase with the full core single clock. We're also doing a monitoring of rotation measure of the pulses to be able to measure RMs very precisely. The plot uh, here shows uh, the variations of the rotation measure for free pulses <laughs> during the sunrise and the data uh, which are the circles match the uh, model in red triangles very well. The constant offset was already subtracted uh, uh, fr from these plots. So uh, we are currently getting down to very precise and accurate measurements of rotation measures down to one, uh, 0.1 radians per square meters. We're also doing uh, scattering studies, and the plot here shows the benefits of LOFARS, a huge fractional benefits. So you can see here how the scattered, uh, remarkable scattering tail of the pulse E2111 plus 46 changing across the band. So with the, this huge fractional band in head, we can study the frequency, we can study precisely the frequency dependence of the scattering parameters for many of the pulses, and as an example, we already have done this for one of the pulses. In this case, 2111 plus 46. Uh, a few words also about single stations. Um, as I already mentioned, they are very powerful telescope on their own, and then, I can, then can operate uh, independently from the array. But to make use of this power, these individual stations are being equipped with the Artemis backend, which, is, uh, which basically implements software and hardware solution to process the streaming data. Uh, more, uh, more details about this uh, you can see in the poster by Magic Serial, uh, but in principle we can already uh, do in real-time searches for the dispersed single pulses with this system. So what is coming? So by the end of September we will quadruple uh, the raw sensitivity of the system. Uh, basically going from the uh, six stations on the single clock to the full core single clock. We are also getting very close to be able to read data directly with DS DSPSR, and we're already uh, working on it to, to do it with Presto as well. By the end of the fall, we will also double the bandwidth of the system from 48 to 96 megahertz with the useful band of about 80 megahertz. We are also implementing the online RFI excision, and in the near future, we will do sub arrays and true flight observations. And um, let me finish off with this slide. Uh, recently, Lofar has announced their call for proposals, uh, cycle zero. So there will be about 10% of open sky time guarantees, and this, this number will increase in the future. The deadline is noon, September 17th, and everyone is welcome to apply. Thank you. trade off your bandwidth for beams, so you can have, for example, four eight station beams, and then you can cover the whole sky both in LB and HB. So it's very flexible.
yes, of course, dispersion measure is not a problem, but scattering basically kicks in and in uh, HBA band about 100, in, in the frequency about 140 megahertz. So I think the scattering is about a millisecond for dispersion measure up to 40, 50, something like that. This is more of a logistical question, but um, if I say one at the time, say 50 pulse hours simultaneously, um, it is, is, it, is it all online uh, polling or is it going to be huge day breaks that are going to require a lot So of we do already have a pipeline working, so basically it's, it's done automatically. It's, as long as you get the data, you just keep in the pipeline and within maybe a day or so, uh, about one, it, it will, roughly with 24 hours, you will get all the folded profiles. Of course, it will require some tweaking because you have to uh, tweak the ephemeris at the very beginning to be sure the special measure is correct. But as long as everything is set up, then it's very straightforward and, uh, and automatic. Great, thanks. I have one more question. Yes, sir. Just, just one comment about the scattering. Uh, the, the scattering de dependence on DM is a stochastic relationship, so um, it's quite possible to have DMs that go over, say, 200 or so, and the scattering to be relatively low, so this kind of survey can actually, it has a chance to find. And this is very true, but of course, usually, usually there is an empirical dependence between the scattering time and the dispersion. Have you some interesting cases with interference, like interference with the dispersion? Mm, well, sometimes, of course, it's not always like the example I showed, but in, in usually it gets, of course, worse at very low frequencies during sunrise and sun, uh, sunset, but not really. I mean, of course, you, we do see occasional RFIs from the fly helicopters uh, or electric fences, but we deal with these problems. And not that much interference we see as we expected. Okay, thanks, Todd, again.